I've cut one of those up and I put it in my gel viewing box. So every time we put gels down in our gel viewing box, we align it to the ruler. So when the kids take a picture, they have that measurement standard. So when they draw a picture of their gel, they can make it to scale with that standard, right? And it's much easier then to recall that picture for the student, if, especially if you're gonna do a, like a standard curve, right? Then they have those measurements there. And you're not relying on, hey, did anybody write those down or write those down? So that little ruler just cut out that little piece, it's about gel size, and when they put their gel, they'll slide it to zero, and then you automatically have a standard for yourself. Kind of a cool little trick. Anyway, um, about me, uh, Patrick Kelly, uh, I'm a teacher like you. Uh, I teach biology, chemistry, I have a CTE. Um, it's health science uh, is the CTE or medical. Um, I've got a medical background. I was a respiratory therapist for about 30 years. Um, I taught respiratory therapy at LA Valley College for about 19 years at the same time I was teaching high school. Um, does anybody here have, has anybody here heard about a CTE credential? Yeah, do you have a CTE credential? Working on it? Yeah, so here's the thing with the CTE credential. Um, it can get you a lot, I mean a lot of money. Right, the state is funding CT credentials well, right? Upwards of ten to twenty thousand dollars per year for your program, right? So the thing for the uh, we're under healthcare um, and uh, medical terminology. Uh, you need um, three years uh, recency experience. One of those years has to be in the last five years. Uh, two of those years have to be in the last ten years, and that experience can be paid or unpaid. So if you, uh, like I did uh, when I was going to Cal State Northridge, I worked in the biology labs. That's recency, that's experience. Working in the hospital as a respiratory therapist, that was recency for experience. So anything you did within uh, this field, or even when you were in college, research, research counts, right? You can do a CT credential, right? And CT credentials through California, um, the only reason why I'm bringing this up because every time I come to these things and I talk about it, everybody goes, what? Never really heard of that. But it's the hallmark of a successful program because funding uh, is what allows you to do really, I mean, the Amgen thing is brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. But if you had more money, look, think about what you could do. My seniors do CRISPR, right? So you can do a lot with some cash. Okay, so anyway. <laughs> I've been at CB Valley High School System for about 23 years, uh, 19 years at LA Valley College. So if you put those together, I've got a lot of experience. Uh, these are the courses that we offer at our school. Uh, I used to teach all four, but now there's not enough of me. So I teach the top three. We've given the biology to another teacher. Um, so we have an honors bio for biotechnology, an honors chem chemistry for biotechnology, an honors biotechnology molecular biology. This is our articulated course with the college nearby, Moore Park College. Uh, for that class, our students can get four units of college credit. Uh, and it's also a 5.8, right, because it's through the UC system. Uh, and then we have an honors science and ethics of biotechnology. Those are our seniors who get to do uh, more expansive labs because we're well funded. Uh, things I like to do, uh, I got a lovely wife. I like to go eat at restaurants in Ventura. I've got a family, uh, one of them's like me, one of them's like my wife, and one of them, well, he's not like either of us. And that's what I like to do on my time off, and that's what I was doing this morning before I got here. All right, so um, they asked me to come just talk to you a little bit. Uh, so strategies, you're, you're gonna learn a lot, right? There's a lot that goes on here. Uh, strategies for preparing your students. I think the most important thing you can do is assess the level your students are at, right? Um, uh, how many of you teach an introductory class? Yeah, so introductory class, you have to assess where they're at. Um, and you have to pick when you want to start your curriculum for this in your semester based on where you're at. Um, so things uh, that you might want to think about, uh, what you've taught, what they know. Uh, have you talked about genetic engineering, recombinant proteins? Right? If you've talked about those kind of things, it makes this a little easier. So if you're implementing at the beginning of the year, make sure you're doing your cell bio at the end of the year, or at the beginning of the year, right? If you're doing that backwards curriculum where you teach ecology first, 
right? If you jump into this when you're teaching ecology, uh, you're going to have to do a lot more teaching, right? So think about what they know and what you've taught. If you talk to them about transformation, if you've mentioned operons, right, all those things really help, right? Um, conservation of genetic material between organisms and species helps as well, right? What allows, what allows us to put our DNA in bacteria, right? Is our DNA the same as bacteria? Ish, right? We have, we have introns. We have some proteins that are complex that need uh, glycosylation and, and other specializations that bacteria can do for us. Uh, but we probably need to mention that, right? We use uh, cDNA libraries, right? Or libraries without introns, right? Uh, if you're more advanced, you can talk about reverse transcriptase, which we can make those segments from mRNA. Um, uh, Pre-reading the lab's always good. Right? So give them an assignment, and I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about that, where they pre-read before you teach. Right? Uh, we can get up here and, and give a, a compelling lecture, right? and it can bring tears to our eyes because we did such a great job. But a lot of kids are just there for the show. Right? So have them invested in their learning, and then when you go to teach them, they'll teach better. Uh, guided flowchart com completion. Um, have you seen the blank? Did you have to fill out the blank flowchart before you got here? Oh, they used to make us do that. Yeah. Easy on you. Yeah, you remember? You had homework to do before you got here. You had to come with your own filled out flowchart. Right? It's a brilliant thing to do. Right? Have them do that and then go over it with them. Right? Uh, watch the videos. They show you good videos here. They're available on their website. Uh, that's the homework after we've gone through the teaching, the flow charts. Watch the video at home before you come tomorrow, right? Because you don't want to waste all your time doing this, right? Uh, when I used to teach, uh, when I used to teach students to go work in hospitals, they said the worst thing you can do in front of a family member on a, with a with somebody on life support is is look at a ventilator and do this. Yeah, really instills confidence, doesn't it? Right, so, um, and then discuss again right before the lab. Right, so all those things are really good, uh, really good advice for somebody just starting out. Like I said, there's a lot um, that you're going to be shown today, and you're going to get back next week, and you, man, that was great, but I can't remember anything we did. And that's the way your students are, and they're less educated than you. Right. All right, uh, think about your pacing. Right? When you check out a lab kit, you have three weeks, right? Three weeks is a long time, right? No, it's going to scream by. Right? So right now, at our school, we're running uh, 73 lab groups, right? Uh, 73 lab groups. We have three teachers. I gather the supplies, and I do all the prep, and I allocate them out. Right? One of our teachers is right there. Another teacher went through it a long time ago, right? So there's a, there's a coordination of events that goes on, right? Um, and I wing it a lot, right? But I've just been doing it a while, so I can, I can get away with winging it, right? But there's a plan, right? Um, especially as you're starting out, think about your pacing, right? So my advice to you is determine the sequence that works best for you, right? Um, sometimes, uh, like for what we do, we'll do because we have a lot of equipment. And we have a lot of equipment because every time they say, hey, we've got a little extra money, do you know? oh, yes, I do need it. Right? I need to replace some stuff or buy some stuff. Uh, I've got stuff that I didn't come in contact with until I was a graduate student in college. Because right? every time they say, hey, we've got some extra money we didn't spend, yeah, I'll take it, and I just buy stuff. So we'll do our pipetting before we go get the Amgen stuff. So I get that off the table. But if you're not, think about what works best for you. Right, so we'll talk about manipulation of DNA. We'll pre-read lab 1.1 pipetting practice. On day two, we may play the pipette video. Uh, we will practice with laminated cards. That's part of your curriculum. Uh, they're going to post this for you so you can upload it. Right? Um, we'll pre-read the lab. Uh, we'll work with centrifuges. And then we go to day three. We practice pipetting with gel dishes. 
So we're continuing our theme. We'll watch our transformation video in class. So we'll keep building. We're not getting to transformation until here, but we've started talking about it because that's the that's a real task oriented thing. Right? So we'll we'll read some things. Uh, we'll go to evaluating results and we'll watch the gel electrophoresis video. So stay ahead of things. Right? Like I said, you have three weeks. Um, anybody on a block schedule? Yeah, so we're on a block schedule now. We've been for two weeks. It was a lot easier before block schedule. Right? The reason it's harder with block schedule is any days that you have to skip, you've lost a big chunk of your week, right? Um, so these are, this is based on a block schedule right here. Uh, and then we'll go ahead, after transformation, we'll do our gels with dice. So that's different than the sequence, isn't it? Right? So a lot of the Amgen pacing does gels with dyes after we practice pipettes. So determine the sequence that works best for you. This works best for us because we go straight from here to our genetic engineering. Right? We've talked about it, but we go to genetic engineering after. Because after gels with dyes, we're going to do restriction digests. And after that, we'll do our crime scene lab. And after that, we'll... So think about your curriculum and what you want to accomplish with your students. Right? And, and then find a pacing uh, and a way that works best for you. Uh, I, I do the con complete genetic engineering sequence, and I was talking to Karen. She's the, the Pierce. Um, and I, we had problems this year, and I was thinking we do our, our, we make our plasmids, and then we do our gels for plasmids, and then we do the transformation with the plasmids we made. But we were talking about maybe for us the sequence would be better, making our plasmids doing the transformation and then doing our gel so we have fresher plasmids. So I'm not freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing. So think about what's best. And if this wasn't a problem when I wasn't on uh, block schedule, but now with block schedule, I'm a week later after I've made my plasma. So think about what works best for you. Um, uh, when you look, uh, you'll get your scheduling, um, and they'll say, here's a calendar. Sign yourself up on the calendar. So when you look at that calendar, don't go, oh, yeah, so Christmas vacation's here. I want to go there. Look at your school schedule. That's what I'll tell you. Because I've scheduled my stuff, and then I notice, oh, we've got assemblies that week. We've got Monday off. We've got, and then all of a sudden, I've lost almost a week of time. So my advice to you is look at your school's master calendar and try to pick a block for your school district where you're going to have three uninterrupted weeks. Because it might save you some time. right? Because you all have been teachers, you know there's times when you have to stop and pivot. right? We didn't get done what we had to do today, or things didn't work out, I need to contact my supply area, and maybe we, we pivot a little bit. Uh, state testing, right? not during a state testing week. I've made that mistake in the past with things. Right? I had all these great plans, and I forgot state testing. Um, anybody questions so far? Are we good? Right on. All right. OK. Uh, if you have, how many people have advanced classes? Right. So advanced classes I do differently. Right. So we're teaching multiple. So my advanced classes, again, assess the level of your students. My Molecular Biology Biotechnology class. By the time we get to Amgen, um, they've done all of this before. Right? So this is like a culminating project for them. Because they take it from, from restriction digest of a plasmid, to making their plasmid, to confirmation, to transformation, to thermocyclers, to confirmation again, uh, using spectrophotometers and, and vertical gels for protein analysis. Right, so uh, look at what you're doing. Um, again, short discussion, pre-read the manual. Now, my advanced students will do all of this on their own. Uh, and one thing they like to do, and we found that works better for them, if you have advanced students, is they make their own flow charts. So these are my students that make these things. So they pre-read, and they develop their own flow charts for every lab we do for the whole year. And they find it's much easier to do science work if they've done the work before they come. 
right? So during a lab, uh, they can have their uh, Chromebook or Microsoft Surface open, but they can't have any lab material open, right? Because all they have is what they've generated, right? And they do amazingly. And I don't have to teach them much at all, right? They are robots. So, and like I said, I've, I've got a lot of equipment, so they'll assemble all their stuff, and at the end, they'll clean it all up, and they'll put it all away, and the next time we do a lab, they know where everything is, they'll get it. So if you have advanced students, don't discount what they can do, right? Don't discount, because they can do great things. You just have to do the training before you get to this point. Um, we do a team approach to labs. I'll just mention that. Uh, this was my secret sauce I found out years and years and years ago, and it just saved my sanity. Right? If you're in high school, I've taught this from freshmen, I've taught this from beginning freshman classes all the way to my honor seniors. Uh, we just have jobs. If everybody has a job, then there's no superstar. Right? If everybody has a job, there's not one person just sitting in the back taking credit for everybody else. Right, so uh, I have a GLP or a good lab practice person. They make the flow chart and it rotates every three labs. You got three person lab groups. So they make the flow charts. Uh, it's on a group document for everybody in their group, but they make it. Uh, they'll modify it. So have you ever been a, in a situation where lab day comes and you go, oh, I'm gonna change a couple things so you write it on the board. So at that point, this person will open up their document and they'll type the changes. Right? And then they have something they're not relying on me. Uh, we have somebody who documents the procedure. Right? SOP is a, is a document. Uh, and they'll make, we have brilliant lab journals. Right? They do lots of great writing. Right? And I've had students bring, email me from really great colleges to say, oh, I'm so happy we did that because I'm in college and everybody's struggling. And I know exactly because I did it for three years in my class. Right? Um, and then we have a project leader. Right? The project leader is a great thing to have. They're responsible for coordinating and managing their lab bench. Right? And they're also the only one in the group who's allowed to talk to me. <laughs> what, I mean, that, is, that was the brilliant part. Right? Especially if you have superstars, because they want to come talk to you all the time. But they have to learn to communicate with somebody who come communicate. And they'll even walk behind them as they come up. <laughs> right? They'll say, no, you can go. They're going to be all right. Right? Jane can do it. I know she can. Right? So what I'm saying is there's a lot to do, but you can you can kind of push this toward we're a, we're a business here. Right? We're a biotech business. We're gonna run like a biotech business. Right? And since I started doing this, my lab counters are clean, they're organized, right, and they're time efficient, right, which was much better. So um, whether you decide to do something like this or not, for more advanced students especially, if you can develop this early and run with it, it does, it saves you and it saves your program a lot. Um, so that's what we do for our advanced students. Uh, so know where your students are, know what their level is. By the time my students are juniors, they've been three years doing this kind of stuff. So they are really talented people. By the time they're sophomores, they're pretty good. When they're freshmen, well, they're freshmen. <laughs> right? There's a lot of struggle to learn, right? Um, but I, I, I talk to my juniors and seniors, and they indicate this has made it much more enjoyable for them because they feel like they're part of a process, right? All right, teacher, teacher preparation. So this is probably where most of you get stressed and struggle, right? It's a lot to do. You're going to pick up kids from, from your dis distribution center. There's going to be a box with a lot of stuff in there. Right? And you're going to have a box with a lot of equipment. Um, and you're going to have stuff that says put in the refrigerator, stuff that says put in the freezer, stuff that says keep in the freezer in the box with the ice packs. Right? So, and you're going to pick those up on Saturday and you're going to have to like make room at your house to put them in your fridge. Right? Luckily, I have a fridge out in the garage. All right, so um, some helpful hints. You have a teacher's manual download, right? And it's like a bazillion pages long, right? It's got a lot of great stuff in it, but you're just worried about getting stuff out to your students. 
here's my advice to you. Go through it and write down page numbers where you find setups for the different labs. Just go through a, a, a quick read of it, because when you get, get back, you'll remember all the, the great things you did here. But really, make yourself a, a list of where to find the stuff you need. And that helps you plan your prep. Right? Uh, determine what's time sensitive and what can be prepared in advance. Uh, when you're going to aliquot your competent cells for transformation, it's 15 minutes before the lab. Right? Um, so if you, if you wait to, to do your plasmids 15 minutes before the lab, your LB 15 minutes before the lab, your water 15 minutes before the lab, you're, you can't do it. Your prep time is not that long between classes, is it? No, but LB, you can do it early and put it in the fridge. It's good. Your plasmids, plasmids are pretty hardy. You can do those in the, the day before, put them in the fridge. Right? Your water, it's water. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of stuff you can do early. So look at what's time sensitive and what you can do a day before. Right? And then get ahead of it. That's my advice to you. Like I said, I'm doing 73 labs right now. Right? And we can do it. And I'm doing chemistry labs that are different on top of that. So we can do it. Um, make yourself, I make myself like recipe lists. So these are my different recipe lists for different days. Right? I got my LB, my RP, my CC. Right? So I write myself recipe lists. And I stick them up on my prep counter. Right? So that's my prep counter. I'm preparing for lab six, which is proteins. I got all my columns set up so I can run them through. Like I said, I've got a lot. I got my pipettes. So I'm all ready to go and I've got my recipe lists for doing what I got to do. Right? Um, so daily fill, use available resources, lab aids, TAs, right? Especially if you've got an advanced class, you've had kids who've had a lab before, there's a lot you can have them do for you. Even if it's setting up empty tubes and labeling them, that's a huge time drop, is writing on every single tube, right? So if you have a TA or a lab aid, right, you can have them set up tubes and label them. It's a lot quicker to fill tubes than to put them in a rack and label them, right? So you can do the, the, um, the technical work if you have them do the lay work, right? So that's what I do. Um, like I said, I have an embarrassment of riches. I have students for four years straight. So my fourth year students volunteer as lab aides. And they go and do a lot of this work under direction for me. So that helps me out. That's how I can do so many classes. Um, and if you have programs like that, uh, if you have people who really enjoyed this, who stay as lab aides the next year in the science department, uh, I send some of those students out to help with the other classes. Does it help you to have my students in your class? Absolutely. Because that, by that time, they've already done transformation four or five times. And they can go and be helpers for new classes that do it. So if you've got great students who are lab aides the next year in other science classes or your class, have them come back, right? A lot of their teachers, like their English teachers, say, hey, we're just writing today. This is a great experience for them. Right? And they feel important, right? Um, so I do that too. That helps with, with stuff we do. I'm doing great on time. Any questions on any of this? No? All right. We'll keep rolling it. All right. Another piece of advice for you uh, is make yourself a basic lab kit. Right? There, are, there are certain things that you're going to use every part of this. Right? Make yourself a basic lab kit. Right? We're all kings and queens of the Tupperware. Right? So make yourself a basic lab kit that you can use every lab. Right? So I've got a P200 and a P20 because those are the most common ones I use for the whole thing. Uh, P1000s, you're going to use them a little bit, especially when you get to lab six. If you have those, put them in there as well. Uh, we got our waffle, our waste cup. I'll put a a handful of microfuge tubes in there, right? Um, so have your basic lab kit so you're not reinventing that wheel every day. 
right? And at the end of the, this lab, you could just take that, put it to the side, and the next day you put it back out and it cuts down your prep time, right? Uh, time is valuable. And then after that, you're just putting out things daily that are different, right? So that, that's a great um, time-saving tip that I, I figured out over time. All right. And the most important thing that I'll tell you is use success and failure to drive learning, right? Um, sometimes it works really well, right? I've got a bunch of fluorescent and a bunch of non-fluorescent colonies for my genetic engineering series. And sometimes we get nothing, right? Um, let success and failure drive learning. And here's the thing, students, I, I pull students later on, um, this lab, just this one lab right here, hooked a bunch of students. It really, it hooks them, right? Because so much of education right now is moving toward, we've got these scripted labs we do, right? And we've got online book publishers, but there's nothing real about it. But this is real living stuff that you don't know the end of the story, right? I've had kids almost cry because they got one pink colony. And it's not because they're sad, it's because none of their neighbors got anything. Right? Success and failure. Let it be your teaching moment. Uh, how many of you fishbone? Oh my goodness. Right? How many of you have heard about a fishbone? You have because I talked to you. This is one of the most brilliant tools I got from Subosh, who used to work at Amgen and run some more Park College program. <coughs> And he says, anytime things don't work perfectly, we fish them. And the brilliance of it is we put our problem here. No transformed colonies. And we draw it. I put it over here because I go left to right like I'm reading, right? But this is what's over here. No transformed colonies. And then I put branches or ribs on my fish. And I come up to everything that could have gone wrong. Uh, cells were too old, or cells were not competent, right? Uh, problems with the plasmid. Uh, problems with the timing of temperature, right? Uh, human error, right? So we, we put all of these on legs, and then we start to come up with, well, let's see if these are viable or non-viable causes. Uh, bacteria is not alive. Well, if it showed up on your LB plate, bacteria is alive. Does it mean they're competent? It doesn't mean they're chemically competent. It means we had live bacteria. Now, if four out of the five groups got transformation, right, and one group didn't, was it that they weren't chemically competent? Probably not. So we have to start looking at some of our other things. Uh, the brilliance of a fishbone, do it with your class. Um, and don't discount anything anybody says. Even if it's just, there is no way to. Right? So kind of rules for that is, you can't blame people. You can only blame processes. Right? Uh, you can come up with reagents, but you can't say, well, it's because we have Jimmy. And have you seen Jimmy? Right? So you can't do that. So let success and failure, I've had so many labs over so many years go so not well. Uh, the rule for my, my students, if anything doesn't work perfectly, when they give me their lab write-up, they have to give me their own fish home. And that guides their writing. How many of you write summations, your students run summations? Uh, do you use repeat So that's the format, results to expectations with evidence. That's the read. Right? Results to expectations with evidence. Our, expect our expectation was that we would transform colonies. Right? Our P is our process evaluation. Did our process work or did it, did, did it not? Right? We got two colonies, we expected much more than that. Right? And our PA is our process adjustments. If it didn't work, here's your PA, your process adjustments. Teach them how to write, when they go to college, they'll thank you.
Because if the biggest thing they struggle with is writing their expected outcomes, right? Something that I can test later, and how to evaluate it. Repeat pods, brilliant. Results to expectations. With evidence, that's the REE, the PE is our process evaluation, and our PA is our process check. And we always start in the third person with our process adjustment. If one were to repeat this lab, I would recommend. Because they're talking to the next reader. Not to themselves, but the next person who comes. So, it's a short presentation. I only took 20 minutes, and I was supposed to get 30. Uh, but does anybody have any questions for me? No? If you get your CT credential and you want to come over to Simi Valley High School, yeah. we, have, we have, I've got two to five more years. I have two, but my wife says five's a good number. Because she has five and a half. Uh, but our program has grown so big, right, that we could use another teacher. But it has, we're looking for someone with a CTE credential so we can continue our funding pathway after I leave. Right on. Okay, well, thank, thank you, you so for your much, time. Patrick. I just want to, my first of all, say thank you so much. And yeah. I just want you to know that you touched on the three major things that came up during the discussion right before you walked in. Oh, good. So one of them was the issue with conducting these level large uh, student groups. So I'm glad you addressed that. Uh, the other one was the role playing, assigning roles, you know, um, and we can do that at any level. So it doesn't have to be, as you mentioned, not only the higher level classes, but you can introduce these roles already with the younger students. Yep. And then Deborah had mentioned how uh, practical it is to actually find, fu find funding to get your own microbibrets, right? So yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that. And we have a webinar series that's already posted on our website of, uh, that my colleagues, uh, Dr. Wu and Karen, are going to give on uh, specifically that topic, how to get grants um, to purchase equipment. And Karen will let you know which equipment and where to purchase it and all that. So, and that's in May, and that's going to be virtual. So, um, thank you so much. Oh, no problem. You addressed all their major concerns so far. And if you have any questions that you think of later on, uh, I'm sure they'll put my email address somewhere. Just email me. I'm, yes, we will I'm share our email addresses. And now we can um, break to lunch. Oh, sorry. <laughs>